This episode of Patriot Plates is brought to you by SaveTheBrave.org, connecting veterans to change lives. Let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. I'm retired Marine Corps Major Scott Husing, and I'm standing here on the deck of the USS Midway, the longest serving aircraft carrier in US history. Over 200,000 sailors served aboard this carrier from the Vietnam War to the Persian Gulf War and many humanitarian missions in between. Today, the USS Midway rests in San Diego Bay. And just over that bridge is the Naval Air Station and Naval Amphibious Base where we train our US Navy SEALs. Coronado is an island rich in military tradition and a great place to find veterans. We scoured the streets looking for veteran license plates and also found naval aviator plaques posted outside of veteran homes. In this USS Midway series, we visit with some veterans volunteering on the USS Midway and veterans now living in Coronado. Welcome to the special edition of Patriot Plates on the USS Midway. My full name is Donald Hubbard. I was in the Navy. I retired as a commander. I was in aviation my entire career. I grew up in the Bronx. I had absolutely no idea what I would do when I graduated from high school. Pearl Harbor changed everything. Immediately the country went to war and everybody, including myself, wanted to en enlist. I actually asked my mother to show me my birth certificate when the war started in 41 and I was a couple of years too young and she wouldn't let me go in. When I became 17, I started hankering to do this and then my brother-in-law suggested Navy or told me to go in the Navy and I did. I got in actually November 9th, 1943. I went down to uh, uh, Manhattan to Pine Street and went to the Naval Air Recruiter and I can still remember I, uh, my mother walking me to the subway in the Bronx to go down to Manhattan and she's crying, you know, like all mothers did. <laughs> Most people don't realize that America was very, very isolationist. We didn't want to have any part of World War II. We had lost a lot of people in World War I and we did not, did not want to get involved in it. My grandparents were German and they had, they had relatives in Germany who uh, they respected and who had starved after World War I because there were no jobs in Germany. On one side I had the Germans, on the other side the English. My English family were, were saving bundles for Britain and my German family were uh, sympathetic with the Germans. I came home from school one day, I was 16, and the war had just begun in Europe in 1940. Hitler had marched into, into Belgium and then overtaken the Marginal Line. And uh, I go, get home and my grandma said, we're taking you to the movies. And I said, well, they never took me to the movies. <laughs> we walked down to the elevated train in, in the Bronx, took about 10 stations down, got out and there was a marquee on a theater in German. We went into the inside 
and everybody there was all speaking German. I didn't speak German. And the movie began, and it was Rudolf Hess. And he said a few words in German, and everybody in the audience leaped to their feet. And he said, Sieg, and everybody in the audience, including my mother and my grandmother, said Heil. Hitler, at that point, was quite a hero because he had provided education, he had provided schools, he had provided uh, jobs, pr principally for the German people, who up until that point were, were destitute. My mother had to uh, accept the fact that I was going into service and might end up fighting Germans. I don't think that ever really occurred to her because she's losing her little boy. My grandmother, on the other hand, had relatives in Germany and she really was uh, upset about the fact that we're going against them. But when Pearl Harbor happened, all of that changed. Nobody even thought about the Germans. We wanted to go out and fight the Japanese. My family and I had been out somewhere. We came home on the bus and I, we were up in our apartment and I was in my sister's room. She had a radio. And all of a sudden the radio announced that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. <laughs> I looked out of the door and I said, hey dad, where's Pearl Harbor? And he said, I don't know. Nobody knew where Pearl Harbor was, unless you were in the military or something like that. But of course that changed everybody's lives. At that point, everybody started to enlist and, and of course the draft had already been on since 1939. 16.1 million people were in the service during the war. One third of them were volunteers like me. Two thirds were draftees. So when you see all these war movies, these young guys that are out there shooting and getting shot at, many of them came in as war civilians and were quickly trained to become fighters and killers. When I went into the Naval Aviation Branch, uh, you always became an officer when you were commissioned, when you were when you received your wings. And they couldn't take kids out of high school, run them through flight training, and give them commissions. So they took all of us, all across the country, and took every new recruit for naval aviation and sent them to college. I was sent to Brown University for one year where I did nothing but uh, take college classes. And it was annoying to me because all my friends by this time were in the Marines or in the Army or in the Navy and they're overseas and I'm sitting in Providence, Rhode Island studying my books. Uh, when that ended, of course, then I, I quickly went into the other parts of the training which included uh, boot camp and uh, pre-flight school and then primary flight training and then eventually into uh, uh, advanced training and, and carrier calls. Everybody that has a navy, has navy wings anyway has to land on the ship at sea to qualify and so after two years of training I finally ended up landing on the USS Wright, named after the Wright brothers, down in Pensacola. I got my six landings and, and I had made it. I had been in Morocco in a squadron there doing uh, top secret uh, flights trying to locate communist radars. I left there, went to the training command and Korea began. And so when I came, when I left the training command, I came to the west coast and they immediately put me into a, a, a squadron which had one job and that, that job was to drop an atomic bomb. And it was the same bomb as they say from, that they use in Nagasaki. Nagasaki it instantly killed 30,000 people and there was residual deaths after that that went up in the 70,000 70, category. Uh, it, was, it was really a surprise to me because it was a completely different airplane than I had been flying before. So my job at that point, I, I had to go to Nuki School, learn how to work with this bomb, two weeks of training there, and then I had to requalify in an uh, enormous airplane that landed on the sh landed and took off from the carriers. I, of course I had carry landings and training but they these little 10,000 pound things had nothing to do with the 33,000 pounder that I was flying for the Korean War. I was given three targets. I had one in China and I had two in Korea. 
And the only ones that knew those targets were my crew and the commanding officer and the intelligence officer. So it was quite a responsibility, and we had a lot of a uh, lot of people. A lot of us didn't really like that. I'd say all of us didn't like it. Uh, in my case, I always just accepted the fact that it would be retaliation. I wouldn't be doing something they hadn't done to us, and th therefore it was justified. Our mission, we would take off, and we'd fly onto the ship. We were stationed in, in Japan. We'd fly onto the ship. The ship would load the bomb into the aircraft, and then we would be launched to go on the mission. To begin with, the bomb was five and a half feet in diameter, six and a half feet long, weighed 10,300 pounds, okay. So you didn't roll it under the plane. You, you, you couldn't do that because the plane was too low. So they had to have a place on the ship or on the beach where you could put the bomb in and then roll the plane over and load it. Well, we actually did it with simulators. So my crewman, all three of us learned how to do this, but the crewman actually took this bucket, which was lead, seven pound nuclear in there, put a ramp into the, into the bomb after he took the front of it off, poured the nuke onto it and pushed it into the center, and then reassembled the front part of the uranium sphere, and then reassembled the front end of the bomb. At that point, the thing was ready to go off. The way that we inserted the nuclear in the bomb had the acronym IFI, in-flight insertion. This was a new thing that they had developed to keep from having to load the, to arm the bomb on the ship or on the, on the beach. They had us do it in the air so that if there was an accidental explosion, uh, it w would only involve the three of us or the people in the airplane. We were supposed to go in and do what is called a split S, drop the bomb and then go inverted and dive. Uh, that was told, we were told to do that. My system was not going to follow that. My system was to drop the bomb and make a, a tight, tight, tight turn and get the hell out of there. I didn't want to go back down because that's where all the anti-aircraft the fighters were. And secondly, in, in re retrospect, when Tibbetts dropped the bomb from the B-29, one of the things that he practiced over and over again was taking a B-29 and make a high-speed level turn to get the hell out of there. And I decided that that was my technique as well. My, my China target uh, was so far inland that I calculated, having been a navigator, I was a fully qualified navigator, I plotted it out and said, I can't make it back to the ship. So I grabbed the intelligence officer and said, what, what are we, we going to do here? The, 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 the minute you launch from the ship, the ship turns around and gets the heck out of there. And he said, oh, we know that. Uh, we're going to tell you where there's a submarine and you can ditch alongside it. Uh-huh. <laughs> sure. <laughs> if there had been a situation where we we're going to drop the bomb, the first thing would be this would be the beginning of World War III. And pilots were certainly expendable in a situation like that. On one occasion, and I was the f first of two guys that had this happen, they decided that we should be launched off the ship with a, quote, a shape. Now, a shape is exactly the same size shape as an original real bomb and we had to be catapulted off. Now, let's put that in perspective. The airplane on landing weight was 33,000 pounds. The bomb was 10,300 pounds. You put the 10,300 pound bomb in a 33,000 pound airplane and you fill it full of fuel. Now you have a little aircraft that weighs 50,000 pounds, 25 tons. You get all set to go you grab a bar and then they push the button and you go from zero to about 100 miles an hour in 250 feet. It's a, it's a real kick in the fanny. So I get on the catapult, it was pouring rain, and off we went and I left the ship, disappeared, and I guess I may have even touched the water, 
but I uh, came flying up, broke out at 6,000 feet with white knuckles holding the throttles. My friends said that they figured I had been killed because I disappeared. Luckily, it was a really stormy night and the bow of the aircraft, the carrier, had come up just as I went off. So that's what saved me. You know, the question always arises, did we do the right thing when we dropped the bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima? I think the consensus of opinion, in Japan at least, is that yes, we should have, because it stopped the war. It would have been absolutely devastating to Japan and to us if that war had continued. In Japan, they were training even the children to, to, to run around with sharpened bamboo stakes to fight the incoming Americans. Uh, whether you can justify this, it, 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 you have to put it in perspective. Before we dropped the bomb, we firebombed Japan. We destroyed entire cities of little wooden homes because the fire just spread from house to house. The Japanese did not have, did not have sophisticated buildings like we do with made of concrete. So the, one of the fire trips up in, into Tokyo, I think they, something like 100,000 people died just from the fire bombs alone. So when we dropped the first bomb on, on, uh, on Hiroshima, first of all, nobody knew what was going to happen. We didn't know what, what the actual result would be. This was a new, new medium of explosion. And in Tibbet's own crew, when they looked back, they said, oh my God, look what we have done. I'd never seen devastation like that. And then Nagasaki was a, an afterthought. It, w it was another target, and it was cloudy, and they dropped it on Nagasaki. Same thing happened. We wiped out an enormous number, number of people. On the other hand, wars cost a lot of people. And in, in World War II, in Russia, 22 million people. And how many people died in, in Europe and in, in, in France? and, and the Japanese and themselves had, had caused devastating losses in China. The, the bat, in Nanking, I think something like 10,000 people were beheaded. So dropping a bomb that killed 30,000 people, 40,000 people, didn't, it didn't really, didn't really register that any more than it was one more bomb. Nobody knew what an atomic bomb was, of course, at that point. So it just was an atomic bomb has been dropped and killed. And I don't mean to think they published a number, they just said wiped out the city. I think that that was the right choice to make. It, it did end the war. Uh, it, 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 peculiarly, when you read about it, the Army General Staff didn't want to end the war. They continued to want to fight. And the Emperor of Japan and the more level-headed other, other people on the, in the government said, we've got to quit because if they, if they actually were making overtures to the Russians to, to intercede to make us to, to stop the war. In other words, have a peace treaty that was being done. But uh, the, the, the general staff wanted to continue and then the emperor, emperor himself said, we will stop. But if that hadn't happened, it would have been, we were, we were going to inv invade southern Kyoto, I think it was. And we had a fleet already lined up to do it. The fleet actually got caught in a hurricane down in Okinawa and got, uh, got very, very badly damaged. But it was an entire, entire invasion fleet to take, to take advantage of, uh, of the defeat, uh, to cause the defeat of Japan. I, I used to get a magazine called The Hook. Now, The Hook is a magazine of naval aviation. And in naval aviation, there, like every, every organization, there are certain traditions. And one tradition in naval aviation in a carrier field is if you get 100 landings, when you get 100 landings, you are designated as being a centurion, 100. And I was looking at the magazine about maybe eight, 10 years ago, and I said, there was a page that said, here is a list of eight old centurions. And I started going through it. I live in Coronado where there's a lot of admirals. I thought maybe I'll know somebody here. 
and there was Ensign George H.W. Bush. He was still an ensign, the lowest rank in the Navy. He already had 100 landings. In Coronado, we have plaques on, uh, naval aviators have plaques on the front of their building that says, a naval aviator lives here. So I took the magazine and I took one of these plaques and I packaged it up and I sent it to Bush down in Texas. And about four months later, I get an envelope with no stamp on it and I open it up and it's a letter from President Bush. <laughs> he said, Dear Don, this note is long overdue, but I write to thank you for the thoughtful letter you wrote me back in August when you sent me a copy of the winter 1991 issue of The Hook. Memories flooded in of days I don't think about anymore. What I do think about are the men who, with whom I served, America's best for sure. I was, it was very nice of you to write, and this fellow Navy man and former commander in chief salutes you for your outstanding service to our country. With respect and warm regards, George Bush. We want to thank the veterans volunteering on the USS Midway and the veterans of Coronado for sharing their stories today. We also want to thank our special sponsors and the USS Midway for making this USS Midway series possible. Don't miss our upcoming veteran stories on Patriot Plates by liking and subscribing below. I'm retired Marine Corps Major Scott Husing, hoping the next time you see a veteran license plate, you'll think about the service and sacrifice behind it. Thanks for watching Patriot Plates. One veteran, one story. Save the Brave connects veterans through outreach programs to build strength of character. Our essential task is to prevent veteran suicide. Save the Brave is committed to providing veterans with post-traumatic stress ways to connect in a safe space. To donate your time, money, or resources, visit savethebrave.org. Reach out to a veteran in need and direct them to Save the Brave.